On behalf of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, thank you for joining us for this virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival presentation. This program is Cokie, A Life Well Lived by Stephen V. Roberts. Stephen V. Roberts has been a journalist for more than 50 years, including 25 years with the New York Times. Since 1991, he has taught journalism and politics at George Washington University while serving as the chief political analyst for ABC Radio and writing a syndicated newspaper column. His eighth book, Cokie, A Life Well Lived, chronicles his late wife's groundbreaking public career as well as her deep devotion to the welfare of other women. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Roberts. Koki died on September 17th, um, 2019. Um, it was just a week uh, after we celebrated our 53rd wedding anniversary. And uh, at her funeral, um, I tried to tell stories about her life. And um, the reaction was so powerful. So many people wanted to hear more about her life that I decided to write this book. It was really that simple to tell stories. You know, over many years, she and I talked about this and how do people learn? And they don't learn from sermons. They don't learn from preachers. They learn from stories. And um, so uh, this is a book of stories uh, about this extraordinary life. And, and let me just read um, one passage from the introduction, which would set the tone for um, your understanding of what this book is about. As I think about her legacy, I'm convinced that her private life was as significant as her public life. Few of us can be a TV star or best-selling author. Every one of us can be a good person. Everyone can learn a lot from how she treated others. Koki did something for someone else virtually every day of her life, especially people who are not famous or wealthy or influential. I tried to capture that spirit in the eulogy that I gave that uh, morning in St. Matthew's Cathedral here in Washington. Here's what I said. During the last days of her life, she was hospitalized at NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And when I would pull up the valet Parkers, all immigrants and not very fluent in English, would say to me, we're praying for Miss Koki. She became very friendly with one of her nurses, a woman named Letitia and absolutely insisted that I rummage through her recipe book at home to find a recipe for crawfish cornbread she wanted Letitia to have. Now, the author of that recipe, by the way, a man named Big Lou, is serving a life sentence in Louisiana's Angola prison. But he was Koki's friend, too. And then there was Judith, another nurse who had two small children at home and was pregnant with a third. Koki kept bugging her, Judith, I want to see pictures of those children. And last Saturday, in the last hours of the last day that Koki was conscious, Judith finally relented and showed Koki pictures on her phone. Koki's face just lit up with that incandescent smile that we all have loved for so long. Judith, she exclaimed, what beautiful children. And the two of them embraced. That moment captured the Koki I'll remember most. Caring about someone else, helping them feel good about themselves, opening her heart and her arms and making the world around her a better, brighter place. You know, Koki loved her male relatives, you know, her son, her grandsons, her father, her brother. She always used to say she and I were crazy nuts about each other, her favorite phrase, until the day she died. We met when she was 18. I was 19. Um, we were still kids. Um, and we were married, as I said, for 53 years. But there's a bright arc for all the affection she had toward, toward men. There's a bright arc that runs through her life, a, 
a, a storyline that um, is inescapable, and that is her support, encouragement, uh, promotion, counseling, consolation for other women. She was a true feminist in the best sense of that word. And her sisterly uh, affections, her sisterly concerns showed up in every single, um, every single part of her life. Um, Diane Sawyer, one of her colleagues at ABC, once said, Koki believed that women would be the ones to save the planet. And I think that's an accurate statement. And I do think that Koki felt that. Um, and as I think about her life, and as I wrote this book, I, I really discerned that there are about five factors that helped shape the woman that Koki Boggs Roberts became. And the first was the discrimination she faced as a young woman. We graduated from college in 1964. Uh, we got married in 1966. Um, she moved to New York. It was the tenor of the times that we didn't even have a conversation about whose job was more important. I was working for the city staff of the New York Times. Koki actually had been hosting her own TV show in Washington at that point, but we just assumed that my job would be more important. And so she moved to New York and went looking for work and encountered this absolute wall of discrimination. Now, this is a woman who wound up writing six national best-selling books, six. And yet she was told in no uncertain terms by almost everywhere she went, we do not hire women to be writers. As if somehow women were genetically incapable of putting two sentences together. It's an astounding story, but absolutely true. And she was told flat out. She often said that if she had a tape recorder in many of these uh, meetings, she could have sued the heck out of these people for blatant uh, discrimination. Um, and as she often said <laughs> with a smirk, why all those men were telling us women that we couldn't have jobs as writers, they put their hands on their knees and were seeking other kinds of cooperation from these women. But um, it, it, was, uh, it was something that uh, uh, was very much a part of her shaping uh, youth and, and shaped her youth. And um, she wrote in her own uh, book, We Are Our Mother's Daughters, she wrote about how uh, women uh, would suffer these uh, indignities, these, these rebuffs privately and silently until they started talking to each other and started sharing these stories and realizing that they were not the only ones and that this was a much larger societal problem. And she said, that's how the women's movement blossomed. It didn't really blossom from the books people read. It was the experiences they had. Koki was a feminist, not because of reading Betty Friedan or Gloria Steinem. She was a feminist because of the life she lived and the experiences she had. And this was true of a great many other women um, that uh, she met. And there's one story that she used to tell all the time uh, that, um, illustrated you know, how depressed she got after we were married, we moved to New York, she didn't have friends and every day she was going out looking for a job and getting very buffed. And uh, she was genuinely depressed. <laughs> she tells a story about how um, she was determined to set little goals for herself every day. And um, uh, so one day she decided she was gonna return a wedding present that we had gotten from a fancy store in New York called York Jensen's. And, um, but as she put it, she couldn't quite get it together to get dressed. So she, she uh, put on a coat and hat over her nightgown and went out into Manhattan to return this wedding present. And uh, she gets to the store and she lines up at the return counter and to her horror realizes that the man in front of her online is the husband of the couple that had given us the wedding present she was about to return. She was absolutely horrified, but realized he was a guy and he probably had no idea what they had actually given us. So she thought maybe she could get away with this. And then the guy in front of her had a problem with his return. So he calls his wife and says, oh, by the way, I, Cokie Roberts is here returning a present. And the wife knew exactly what was going on, started laughing and said, put Cokie on the phone with me. 
laughing our head off saying, what are the odds that in a city of 8 million people, as you're trying to return my wedding present, you run into my husband? And they all had a big laugh. And the husband was a reporter at the New York Times, a good friend of mine. And he was about to go cover Governor Rockefeller swearing in as second term as governor. So he says to Koki, well, no hard feelings, Koki. Why don't you come with me to the Rockefeller swearing in? Now, as Koki points out, she was still wearing her nightgown under this coat. And they get to the Rockefeller swearing in. And this is, you know, this is uh, 1966, 67. Um, TV lights were very hot and, and harsh in those days. And uh, of course, the room was all lit up for TV and you know, she's wearing her coat. And everybody says to her, can we take your coat? <laughs> and she's wearing her nightgown. And she goes, oh, I, <laughs> I can't mimic her very well. She says, oh, I'm from the South. I'm always cold. I'll have to keep my coat on. <laughs> and she stands there through the whole ceremony in her nightgown. And then after the ceremony is over, this friend of ours says, come on, Koki, I'll take you to lunch. And Koki, as Koki told the story, at that point, I wasn't a total idiot. And I agree. I said, no, no, no lunch. I'm going home. But it's such a touching story because this woman who became so famous and so self-confident and so successful had this period of feeling very badly about herself and very depressed because of the discrimination she faced. And that was one of the five major factors that helped shape the woman that she eventually became. Uh, a second factor was her faith. Uh, she uh, was a deeply devout Catholic. Um, as many of you know, from New Orleans and Louisiana, her mother, Lindy Boggs, eventually became the American ambassador to the Vatican. And this is symbolic of the family's deep attachment to their Catholic roots and their Catholic faith. But as she was, the cookie was the first to say, wasn't always easy being a, a woman in the Catholic Church. Um, uh, she often said when people would ask her, is there anything about the church you would change? The first thing she always said was ordain women. And that would change the nature of the Catholic Church. And she struggled with being a woman in a church that often relegated women to second class status. As she said, you know, the nuns who taught us at the Rosary in New Orleans and, and, and uh, Sacred Heart schools here in Washington. The nuns said we could be anything we wanted except priests. And that always rankled. And, and it was symbolic of, of, of the fact that women were relegated to second class status in the Catholic Church. And um, she struggled her whole life uh, with that, but kept coming back to the fact that and she always said, this is my church. And I'm not going to let those, those men drive me away. I'm not going to let the scandals in the church drive me away. I'm not going to let the discrimination drive me away. It's my church, it's my faith, it's my relationship to God and to Jesus that uh, I cherish, and I'm going to remain, uh, remain devout. And you can't understand Koki's life without understanding she believed in the most basic precepts of, of her faith. She often said, you know, um, that uh, the nuns always taught uh, that uh, to those uh, who receive much, much is expected. And she lived that way. She lived the gospel. She lived the gospel of uh, serving others and, and, and being charitable to others every day. And uh, she lived another uh, dimension of the gospel, which is, she always used to quote this, that as a small child, we were taught in school, every person, every human being is shaped in the image and uh, the image and likeness of God. And she treated people that way. You know, that story about the, the, the nurse that she embraced, the, um, the Parkers at the, at the hospital, that's the way she treated everybody. And, and it, it really um, uh, flowed from her Catholic faith. And as many of you know, she attended the rosary um, in, in New Orleans uh, as a small child. Um, then when she was about eight, uh, after her dad, Hale Boggs, was defeated, uh, he ran for governor of Louisiana in 1951, was defeated kept his seat in the House of Representatives. And at that point, the family decided to um, basically move their base to Washington and, and put the kids in school in Washington full time. That's when they bought the house that I'm sitting in today. Um, it's the same house that uh, Lindy and Hale bought when Cokie was eight years old. And I'm speaking to you from um, that same house uh, all these years later. And when she came to Washington and um, 
started attending the Sacred Heart School um, here in Washington um, called Stone Ridge. Um, uh, she had a deep bond with the nuns, uh, first at the Rosary and then here in Washington. The Sacred Heart nuns were an order that Koki always felt very close to. In fact, one of the books that she wrote, um, she dedicated to the Sacred Heart nuns and very, uh, it's very instructive that the dedication says to these nuns who took girls seriously in the 1950s, which was not a particularly popular or widespread idea, but she always traced a lot of her sense of confidence, a lot of her um, uh, academic and intellectual development uh, to the nuns. Uh, and um, as I say, she was always uh, deeply, um, uh, deeply devoted to the Sacred Heart Order. Um, and in fact, when we first met, um, and I'm Jewish and she was Catholic and um, a number of the nuns from the Sacred Heart Order had um, uh, moved to a, a college in Boston called Newton College of the Sacred Heart. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been absorbed by Boston College. But a number of her nun friends were there and she trotted me out one, one day, one Sunday to meet the nuns, you know, as her Jewish boyfriend. And I, I was very clear that if the nuns didn't approve, this relationship was not going anywhere. <laughs> um, that's how deeply she felt uh, ab about the nuns. Um, but she was also a, um, and, and her whole life, she was devoted uh, uh, to the nuns. And anytime uh, a nun asked her to do something, she tried to do it. And one of her great friends was a woman named Joan Magnetti, Sister Magnetti, who late in life, uh, late in her career was um, headmistress at a school in Bridgeport, Connecticut. She calls Cokie once and says, look, Cokie, I gotta be honest with you. Um, we've got a promise from Mother Teresa to be our graduation speaker, but um, she's notoriously unreliable, and I need you to be the backup in case Mother Teresa doesn't show up. And so about a week before the graduation, uh, in fact, Mother Teresa was in Rome. She fell. She broke a rib. She had to cancel. And so Koki shows up at the school, and Joan told me this story. Koki comes out in this bright orange-yellow dress with a big hat um, and, and Jones, you know, looking gorgeous and Jones uh, telling, throws her arms out and says to the assembled crowd, clearly I am not Mother Teresa. And, um, but whatever the nuns wanted, Koki always tried, um, always tried to accommodate them. And in fact, at her funeral, um, uh, I made it, I was determined to provide a, a role for the nuns who had played such a big part in her life. And they brought up the gifts, a, a delegation of Sacred Heart nuns brought up the gifts at the at the funeral mass in St. Matthew's Cathedral and all of them in honor of Koki wearing bright red scarves, um, symbolic of her devotion to the church. And, but you know, Koki was a woman of faith and that meant that she was serious about all faiths and all religions. And she embraced my Judaism uh, joyously and wholeheartedly and insisted that we practice a lot of Jewish rituals, which I did not practice as a child. I was not raised that way. Uh, one of the most, uh, uh, the rituals that she was most devoted to was the uh, Passover Seder. Um, in fact, we, uh, uh, the, my mother often said that the first Seder she ever went to was organized by her Catholic daughter-in-law. And uh, uh, over the years, uh, we came to say that Koki was the best Jew in our family. Koki would always say there was not a lot of competition for that title, um, but she loved it. She embraced it um, and uh, made the, uh, you know, the merging of our faith so much easier because she so joyfully um, embraced it. And in fact, there's an ancient Jewish organization called Tadasa. It was it's an organization of Jewish women. Um, there was primarily devoted to raising money for health facilities, healthcare facilities in Israel. It's been around for a hundred years. And uh, Koki spoke so often to Jewish groups and was so popular that at one point she was named a life member, a, a life member of Hadassah. I gotta believe she's the only child of an ambassador to the Vatican who was named a life member of Hadassah. But that reflected um, her faith. Now, we reflected how seriously uh, she took it. 
Third factor that helped shape Koki was her education. I mentioned the nuns, they were very, very important to her. And in, in her entire education, Koki never went to school um, in a co-ed school. Uh, she always went, uh, the Sacred Heart schools were all, all girls. And she went to an all women's college, Wellesley College in Massachusetts. Um, and um, she always said that that had a very positive effect. She said, girls had a chance to talk because there wasn't anybody else. Um, and it helped breed that confidence, helped breed that um, uh, sparkling personality that we all came to love on radio and television, but it was encouraged and fostered and nurtured, uh, she always believed, by the fact that going to um, all women's schools, uh, there were no men to overshadow the women, there were no men to push them aside, that uh, women did everything and women could speak out. and. Uh, Koki never had much trouble speaking out, uh, but the schooling uh, made a big difference. But, you know, she gone to Catholic schools uh, and through high school as, and her brother and sister, her older brother and sister, both went to Catholic colleges. So Koki, by going to Wellesley, did break free from one family tradition. She was the first and only of the three box children to go to um, a non-Catholic school at any stage of her education. And the, the story is told about Lindy, um, a, a woman many of you I know remember with great fondness. But Lindy was a little upset about this and she and Hale drove Koki to, to college. Um, <laughs> Koki always said uncharacteristically because often they were off doing political things. This is actually in the fall of 1960, just a couple of months before uh, Kennedy was elected, but they drove her up to Wellesley. It's a beautiful campus. And uh, Lindy was uh, uh, trying to restrain her um, remorse or, or or at least her concerns about uh, about this and finally the story is told in the family as they were leaving the campus Lindy turned to Hale burst into tears and said I've left my baby at a Yankee Protestant Republican school and every time I heard that story from my mother-in-law I always said which of the three was the worst and and she always changed it by the way, the Jewish son-in-law, strike four, oh, he wasn't even in the picture. But um, Wellesley was a great experience for Koki, but there's a wonderful story I tell in the book. Her older sister, Barbara, uh, had gone to a student political meeting earlier that summer, uh, the summer of 1960, before Koki um, went to Wellesley. And Koki was only 16 when she went to college. The nuns had skipped her ahead in school. She was only 16 years old. And so, uh, Barbara meets a woman uh, um, named Marsha Goldstein, Marsha Burek at the time, uh, who um, was the delegate from Wellesley. And as Marsha told me the story, Barbara said to her, look, you know, Marsha, I have a, my little sister's going to Wellesley and she's very shy, shy. It gotta be the only time in her entire life, Cokie Roberts was described as shy and shows how little Barbara knew about her younger sister. So Barbara says to Marsha, you gotta look out for her because she's always been taught by nuns. She's really not very worldly. She's only 16. So at Wellesley, they had a, a system of big sister, little sister. They would, um, older uh, upperclassmen would be assigned to sort of mentor and look out for freshmen. So Marsha uh, went to the woman uh, who was arranging the, this whole, these pairings and said, I'll take Cokie Boggs as my little sister. So, because her, her older sister asked me to look out for her. So Marcia tells me the story about the first time she meets Koki. It's, there's a picnic where first week of school where the older uh, upperclassmen are meeting the, the freshmen. And uh, Marcia's looking out for this meek little child of, you know, who 16 year old taught by nuns and in bursts this tornado of energy trailing 10 of her best friends that she's made in the last two days behind her. And this is the shy little 16 year old that Marsha was led to believe. And Marsha said, look, start, this was September, 1960. Koki knew more about politics than all the rest of us put together. She immediately took over the picnic, presided over the whole uh, event. Marsha's gobsmacked and finally goes up to her and says, you know, I'm your big sister. Uh, is there anything I can do for you? And Koki looks at her and says, is there anything I can do for you? And that was Koki to a T. <laughs> And that's how she lived her whole life. Even at 16, she was uh, took over that uh, party. And um, 
it's it, it's very much uh, but Wellesley was an important part of her education um, again because women did everything and uh, she and other women were encouraged to speak out to be leaders and she always felt that maybe not as important as sacred heart nuns but pretty important fourth factor in understanding the woman uh, Koki became uh, was Lindy uh, Claiborne Boggs her mother uh, many of you are familiar with Lindy um, who um, spent 18 years as a member of Congress representing the second district of Louisiana which is uh, largely the city of New Orleans she succeeded her husband Hale Hale had spent 30 years representing the city of New Orleans and then was killed in a plane crash in 1972 campaigning for another fellow member of Congress in Alaska. Lindy ran for the seat and succeeded him served for nine terms so my in-laws represented the second district for most of 50 years from 1940 to 1990. I often joke that we don't believe in term limits in our family obviously. Lindy had an enormous impact, in many ways much more than, than Hale. Lindy had an enormous impact um, uh, on, on Koki, and it's, it's no accident that Koki's first book, her first big national bestseller, which launched her career as a book writer in middle age, was called We Are Our Mother's Daughters. And she prided herself, she reveled in the notion of being Lindy Box's daughter. And in fact, in one interview said, when I'm being my best self, I'm being my mother's daughter. And that meant a lot of different things. Um, one of them was an appreciation for history. Um, as some of you know, as I mentioned, Lindy's uh, maiden name was Claiborne. Yeah, right there in New Orleans is Claiborne Avenue, right? This is named for her family. Um, the first Claiborne to come to Louisiana was a man named W.C.C. Claiborne, William Ch Charles Cole Claiborne who was the first governor of the Louisiana Territory appointed by Thomas President Jefferson in 1803 after he bought the Louisiana Territory. And that's how far back uh, Lindy's family goes. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a, a, a scholar here in Washington who did a uh, study of uh, prominent families in American political history. And he did a ranking system depending on what offices, how many times various family members had served in what offices, and he assigned points and got a ranking system. And in his first version of the of his uh, manuscript, the uh, number one family was the Roosevelts because the Roosevelts had two presidents. Second were the Kennedys, third the Claibrons, because um, uh, going back to 1620, first Claiborne came to America in 1620. Uh, and uh, in virtually every generation since then, at least one Claiborne has served in public office, not just in Louisiana, but many other states as well. Claiborne Pell was a senator from Rhode Island. His father, Herbert Pell, had been a, a congressman from New York. And so the Claibornes were number three. And Cokie, in her own fashion, looked at the manuscript and said to this author, Steve Hess, Steve, you've missed about five members of my family. There are Claiborne's that you haven't counted. And she forced Steve to recalibrate his rankings. And now the Claiborne's are number two ahead of the Kennedys. Um, I mean, they're newcomers. They didn't come till the 19th century. Claiborne's, you know, came in the 17th century. Um, and so they're number two in, in terms of this ranking is the most prominent uh, family in American political history, second only to the Roosevelt's. And that is a legacy Koki was very uh, aware of. Uh, her mother, uh, as I say, Lindy Claiborne embodied that, uh, but also her mother talked a lot about the history and Koki grew up surrounded by the history of her family in New Orleans and their contributions to American politics. And um, it meant a lot to her, uh, but it wasn't just her own family history. Lindy came to Washington in 1940 when Hale was first elected to Congress. He was only 26 years old. He was defeated in 42 and reelected in 46. And after the war, he spent the war in the Navy and comes back, gets elected in 46. And um, so Lindy um, was a very young woman in Washington. And um, in her 20s, she had two children. Koki wasn't born until 43. But um, uh, she recalled how uh, 
so many of the, of the women she knew in Washington had played such critical roles in advising and, and, and counseling their husbands. It was a period, of course, where almost no women held public office in their own right. But her close friends were women like Mrs. Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson, and uh, Mrs. Al Gore. Um, Mrs. Al Gore, who was the wife of a senator, the mother of a senator and vice president. Um, and, and these women, uh, in, in Lindy's telling, Cokie's telling, um, were extremely important. Uh, we know about Mrs. Johnson's impact because we've some tapes have now been released in recent years, which document how important uh, she was in advising her husband, the president, and and how much he consulted her. And that those um, Cokie grew up with this. She grew up with seeing women like her mother and Lady Bird Johnson and Pauline Gore play such critical roles as, as advisors and supporters. And that led directly to her sensibility to write history books, which uh, re rescued and resurrected and reflected the enormous and overlooked contributions women have always made to American history. And uh, she wrote three of them. After We Are Our Mother's Daughters, she wrote uh, Founding Mothers, Ladies of Liberty, and Capital Dames, three major historic uh, books, all of which uh, were critically important in uh, reviving and, and, and really uh, highlighting the enormous roles that women have always played. And one of Cokie's favorite characters in history was Dolly Madison, who, uh, and, uh, and Cokie often said, you know, of all the women I've written about in history, the one who reminded me most of my mother was Dolly Madison. Um, she, of course, was the wife of President Madison, but she presided over Washington salons where members of both parties came together. Uh, she was very known for this. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Cokie always used to love to tell the story that uh, one, uh, uh, the man who ran against, uh, James Madison um, uh, and lost um, uh, said afterwards, well, I had to run against both Mr. and Mrs. Madison. And if I had only had to run against Mr. Madison, I might well have won. But because I also had to run against Dolly Madison, I lost. And another um, story Cokie used to love to tell where uh, someone said to uh, Dolly Madison, you know, everybody loves Mrs. Madison. And Mrs. Madison turned to him and said, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everybody else. Cokie would then add saying, I've read Dolly Madison's letters and that's not true. <laughs> Dolly Madison did not love everybody, but she gave the impression that she did. And that was one of the ways in which um, Lindy Boggs reminded Cokie so much of Dolly Madison because Lindy had this marvelous political instinct to be able to smooth over a lot of rough edges and relate to all political factions. It's one of the reasons after Hale died that, that she was virtually elected by acclamation to his seat because she, everybody in New Orleans knew that Lindy was Hale's closest advisor and, um, uh, and campaign manager and uh, would carry on his legacy. But interestingly, of course, Dolly Madison never had to serve in public office. So she keep up the facade that every she loved everybody. Lindy, when she got elected, had to vote. And that was a very uncomfortable thing for her to do in many ways because she had to reveal her true feelings in the way she voted. And her older, her older daughter, Cokie's older sister, Barbara, uh, a very shrewd politician in her own right who served for many years as mayor of Princeton, New Jersey. And Barbara said to her mother, you know, mama, when you go to vote, there's no maybe button. And so while uh, Lindy, uh, an enormous influence on Cokie, reminded her of Dolly Madison, uh, there was that difference that once Lindy actually got elected, she had a vote and um, reveal her true feelings on a lot of issues. But her, uh, Lindy's uh, uh, influence on Cokie was enormous. Uh, and um, uh, as many of you know, uh, after she retired from Congress, after the uh, 1990, served nine terms, and then um, spent um, a few years in sort of a 
extended uh, farewell tour. And then the second Clinton term, President Clinton made her the American ambassador to the Vatican. Now she was in her 80s. And, um, and she, uh, this was, she wasn't sure she wanted to do this. And Koki was determined that her mom was going to do this. And so she said two things to her mother. She said, well, the first thing, Mama, is that if you go to the Vatican, you get to do the two things in the world you love to do most. Go to church and go to parties. And that was her job as ambassador, and that turned out to be true. But of course, as some of you know, Lindy, for many, many years, lived right on Bourbon Street. She inherited a house from her um, great aunt, uh, uh, Frosty Morrison, um, 623 Bourbon Street, right in the middle of, of the French Quarter. She was a great figure in the French Quarter for many, many years. Um, and Koki, in, in encouraging her mother to go to uh, the Vatican, would kind of with a wink say, well, mama, you know, if you go from the French Quarter to the Vatican, the costumes will be the same, guys wearing dresses. So she, um, and Lindy did go and spent, you know, four years, for, four very happy years as the ambassador to the Vatican. Uh, but um, her impulse and her uh, model for Koki was profoundly important. Um, and the, um, the fifth uh, influence that very important in shaping who Koki Boggs Roberts became um, was her sense of continuity with women through the ages. As I said, Koki was a very ardent feminist, but she was also a traditionalist at the same time. And she kept saying, even as she fought, no one fought harder for women's rights. No one promoted women more aggressively. No one uh, helped and counseled and argued. I talked to a, an executive at ABC who said Koki would regularly come into his office and in his phrase, bust my chops to encourage me to promote women. And, and, and uh, there were a lot of sexist men in, in ABC when Kogi got there. And uh, she was the most ardent foe of that sexism and the one who encouraged and promoted other women uh, as much as she possibly could. Uh, but um, uh, at the same time, she always said, even as we advance, even as we achieve these professional successes, even as we, uh, acquire this this stature and standing professionally, we cannot, should not, must not forget the traditional roles we women have always played as the caretakers and the nurturers. And she often said, I worry that as we become so much more successful and as the barriers fall and as we um, uh, make our way in the professional world, I always worry that we'll forget these traditional roles and Koki never ever ever forgot those those traditional roles and and the importance of them and uh, in her book we are our mother's daughter she wrote a very touching paragraph about we lived in Greece for four years and I was the New York Times correspondent there and uh, Koki talked about going to a uh, a cemetery and, and a museum uh, in the town of Marathon, known much better as the place where, of course, uh, the first marathon uh, runner ran from there to uh, the capital of, uh, of Athens to warn about um, an attack. But uh, Marathon was a city, it was a town. And there's this little, we used to go to the beach there. And uh, there was a little museum we went to and Koki talked about looking at the implements that were left. And she said, what was left of the man? Well, instruments of war, maybe some instruments of religious ritual, but nothing else. She said of the women, there were these cooking implements and there were these makeup pots and there were these jewels. And they just symbolized to Koki this sense of continuity. And she had this wonderful line where she said, I looked at those uh, displays and I could have picked up the tools and put on the jewels that I saw in those cases and been one with the sisters that I um, felt such a strong association with. In fact, that line meant so much to me that on the back of her 
uh, tombstone in Congressional Cemetery here in Washington. In fact, one week from today that I'm recording this talk is the second anniversary of her death. And on the back of that tombstone, it says, pick up the tools and put on the jewels because that expressed so clearly and so powerfully uh, her message to other women. Do not forget, do not forget this traditional role that we have always played. And so therefore, if you think about Koki's life and the life I have written about, there are always two sides to this. There was, of course, the public side. Um, and she was an enormously important figure to so many women as an inspiration. Uh, I, I heard this over and over again. One woman who talked about when Koki first went on television uh, and started um, participating in the Sunday show on ABC. And this woman herself was a TV producer. And she said, I, I remember talking to my women friends who said, I'm watching ABC more now because Koki's on. Because Koki always asks the questions I want asked. Koki always makes the points I want made. She was speaking for countless women who not only were cheering her on because she was going toe to toe with all of these guys, but because she had a perspective, she had an insight into what women cared about. And she spoke for countless women during these TV broadcasts. And this public side of her was, was very, very important. And, you know, Diane Sawyer said, she made you feel brave. A woman named Jean Becker later became uh, chief aide to President Bush 41. Jean was in journalism school when Koki first started doing TV. And, and Jean talked about watching Koki and saying, she made you feel like you could do anything. I had countless women say to me, Koki was my role model when I was a child. I interviewed a woman for the book named Amna Nawaz, who is now a, uh, an anchor and reporter on the PBS NewsHour. And Amna said, you know, she was a family where uh, immigrants from Pakistan. And Amna says, you know, when I was a child, um, my mother gave me Koki's books and said, this is who you can emulate. You can be Koki Roberts. You can be that strong. You can be that smart. Just the other day, I ran into a woman who said she was growing up in a small town, rural Minnesota, farming town. And her English teacher, when she was just a child, to encourage students to be more inquisitive about language, gave extra credit if they would copy down a passage in a book they read or something they heard that meant something to them as an example of good writing. And this was extra credit. And my friend Lisa said, here I was a small child and every morning I would listen to Morning Edition on NPR and I would listen to Koki and I would copy down for my extra credit things she said because she was the only broadcaster I listened to who actually spoke in full sentences. Think about that. Think about, there were countless young Lisas. There were countless Jean Beckers. There were countless women all across the country who cheered Koki on and, 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 and felt better about themselves, felt more courageous, felt more confident because they looked up there and said, if she can do it, I can do it. I can be Koki too. But in many ways, I believe, and I believe this strongly, that the message of this book and the message of Koki's life is that her private life, her private acts of generosity and charity and consideration, actually more important even than her public life. Because as I said earlier, not everybody can be a TV star. Everybody can be a good person. Everybody can learn something about how she lived her life day to day outside the glare of publicity. In moments, she wasn't Hale and Lindy's daughter. She wasn't a TV star. She wasn't my wife. She was simply a friend, primarily to other women. 
in ways that are just so instructive and, and so inspiring. Let me tell you a couple of the stories. So there was a woman named Sonia McNair, a uh, African-American woman who worked at ABC. And she was still in college. She was a young woman in her early 20s. She was, the job she had at ABC was basically just to help pay her way through college. She was, she was more of a receptionist than anything else, really wasn't a TV producer or anything. But um, a tragedy happened in, in Sonia's life. A, a, a cousin of hers with a small child was actually murdered by her boyfriend and leaving this child an orphan. And Sonia's grandmother or the child's grandmother took the child in and then within a year, the grandmother died. And Sonia found herself being the caretaker in her early twenties of this child. And she would come to Koki constantly as she told me for advice, um, for uh, encouragement. Um, and, and Koki was just the person she always came to. And then a few years later, Sonia's brother died and the family was bereft. And there was a funeral at this uh, black church in downtown Washington. Sonia describes how the family is just deeply wounded and suffering. And they're at the church and the service is about to begin. And in walks Cokie Roberts walks down the central aisle of the church, the only white person in the church. Walks all the way down the aisle, comes to the McNair family and embraces Sonia's mother. And Sonia said, it was like my two mothers embracing. And she said, it meant so much to us at that moment, the warmth that Cokie brought. And she did this over and over and over again with so many people. I mentioned earlier a woman named Marsha Burek, later Marsha Goldstein, who was the woman who was her big sister at college. Years later, Marsha had a child who was a freshman in college uh, and was prescribed uh, various drugs um, and uh, for to combat depression. And Marsha, as her par as his parent, was never told that these drugs could cause uh, sudden and serious suicidal impulses and this 18 year old who couldn't buy a drink legally in the state of maine bought a shotgun went back to the campus and killed himself and marcia says i'm sitting there the morning of the funeral i don't even know how Koki knew and in walks Koki. i didn't even know how she even knew about the funeral knew about the, my son's death she sat with me all morning as well-wishers came through, mourners came through, sat with me in the back of the limousine as we went to the funeral. And then at the graveside, literally held me up as she buried her son. Held her up. And that's what she did. She held everybody up. She was at their side. And she did it over and over and over again. There's a woman at NPR named Carol Klinger, Koki also, long before she was diagnosed with breast cancer herself, was an advocate for more research for breast cancer and researched the subject um, deeply and knew a great deal about it. And women, when they were first diagnosed with breast cancer, often came to Koki for advice and consolation and and there's a woman at NPR named Carol Klinger who went to Koki and Koki advised her to go see another doctor, get a second opinion, seek different treatment. And Carol just says simply, I think Koki saved my life. I think she saved my life with the advice she gave me about how to handle this illness. And then there's a story that Nina Totenberg tells many of you know Nina's voice and name as longtime Supreme Court correspondent of NPR and one of Koki's dearest and closest friends. And uh, Nina um, married a man much older than she was um, named Floyd Haskell. He had been a one-term senator from Colorado and he went through some real health problems where Koki was always at Nina's side, <laughs> went to all of the appointments with her. Uh, Koki always said, you know, when, when you, 
when you go to med these medical appointments, um, you have to have an advocate, you have to have a friend, you have to have someone to go with you because you don't, you're so frightened and you're so upset. You don't hear things clearly. She did this countless times with, other, with friends, various hospital rooms and doctor's offices. And, uh, and then Nina's uh, husband um, eventually did die. And Nina said, I had no idea what to do. And Koki just took over the way Nina put it, took over Floyd's death and helped her plan the funeral. And one of the things that the two women had to do, Koki at her side, was to pick out a casket. Nina told the story, they were at a funeral home and she was trying to decide between two, two uh, models, one of which was a little more expensive than the other and the rather obsequious uh, character who was employed by the funeral home to sell caskets, of course, wanted to get her to buy the more expensive one. And as Nina told the story, the, they're trying to decide which one to buy. And this man says to Nina, well, Mrs. Totenberg, Miss Totenberg, you know, your husband was quite a tall man. So therefore, I think he'll be more comfortable in this more expensive casket. <laughs> Nina says, I turned to Koki and the two of us could not suppress our giggles. She said, imagine that. Here I am picking up my husband's casket. And yet here was this friend at my side who I could share a laugh with at a time when laughing was by far the most therapeutic and, uh, and beneficial thing I possibly could have done. She said, you can't do that with everybody. You can't, you can't do that with hardly anybody. Who can you laugh with at that moment? Koki was the one. The other thing about Koki was she was an absolute freak about babies. She loved babies. She would, if there was a baby within a hundred yards of her, she would scoop it up. And she was very good with babies, got, always got them calmed down. And um, countless of her young friends uh, tell the stories, tell stories about uh, uh, her uh, counseling them, encouraging them, reassuring them. Um, one one woman said to me that she, she was a young producer at ABC, had her first child, and the child's crib was under a, a window, and the, she was deathly afraid that somehow the uh, cord from the Venetian blinds was going to strangle this child. And Koki says to her, and this was a direct quote from Lindy Boggs, Koki was just channeling Lindy, as she often did, and she, said, she says to um, uh, Avery, um, when did babies get so stupid? <laughs> They're not going to, your child is not going to strangle yourself. By the way, if you think the name Avery is familiar, yes, uh, Avery Miller is a real Avery from Avery Island um, with deep Louisiana roots. Um, and, uh, you know, she says, you know, at that moment, all I needed was an older woman to say, please relax, it's going to be okay. And she did this all the time. One of her favorite adages to young mothers was babies don't break calm down you'll be fine the baby will survive um, and uh, one woman alana marcus tells me the story about uh, koki showed up koki was at every maternity ward i mean she just someone had a baby koki was the first one there and alana tells me a story about koki showing up uh, after alana had her first baby and uh, Koki immediately scoops this child up. And um, uh, as Alana says, it, my child was Jewish, but Koki uh, makes the sign of the cross and baptizes his child and looks up at Alana and says, you don't mind if I do this, do you? We're just covering our bases. <laughs> and Alana said, fine, it's a Jewish child, but if you want to baptize him, it's okay with me. Um, but she was always there. She was always there for those young young moms. And another one of her, uh, her former assistants, Annie uh, Whitworth Downing tells the story about how after she had her first baby, um, Koki kept saying, when are you gonna bring that baby to the office? And, and, and Annie said, I'm not gonna, Koki, I'm not gonna bring my baby to the office. And Koki says, come on, I'll take care of her. It'll be okay. So Annie says, fine, I did bring my child a couple of times to the office and she said, I have this wonderful memory of Koki cradling the, my baby in one arm and working her mouse in her computer with the other. And she just, 
woman is multitasker. Mother, as um, Cookie always said, we hire the moms because the moms know how to get things done. And um, Annie just has this indelible memory of um, Cookie at that computer holding her baby and getting her work done. And that, that was Cookie, the public and the private fused together in that moment, doing her work, being a hero, being a, an authority in public and being a friend in private. And um, Cookie has a, had a childhood friend they met when they were 10 years old, named Cinder Pratt Perlman. Um, you know, Cokie married a Jewish guy. She thought she was departing from tradition. Uh, Cinda was the sister of a nun who married the son of a rabbi when it went us one, one better. But she told me this story. She said, you know, all of those people who have these bracelets that say WWJD, what would Cokie do? Um, what, what, Cinda told me this story. She said, look, all those people who have these bracelets that say WWJD, what would Jesus do? I want a bracelet that says WWCD, what would Cokie do? And the truth is, countless of her friends told me in almost the same words that even now, they ask themselves when faced with a crisis, faced with a decision, faced with any kind of problem, Cokie is the moral touchstone. Cokie is the model that they think about, that they try to emulate. And the story I end the book with is this. As I was writing the book, a year after Cokie died, uh, my younger brother died. My younger brother had suffered from, my younger brother Glenn had suffered from Parkinson's for many years. And uh, his, he only lived 15 minutes from me here in Washington. And, his wife called me one morning to say, we almost lost him last night. And if you wanna see him one last time, you better get over here today. And I did, I went over and I held his hand for an hour and kissed him goodbye. And a day or two later, the phone rang at six o'clock in the morning. It's never good news at six o'clock in the morning, as we all know. And it was my sister-in-law saying, Glenn died overnight but it's only six o'clock in the morning, so you can go back to bed. I sat there literally with the phone in my hand. And I said to myself, what would Cokie do? And I knew, I got up, got dressed, and started driving to my brother's house 15 minutes away. Along the way, I called my sister. And I knew that my sister had heard of our brother's death. And I called my sister and I'm talking to her in the car as I'm heading to my brother's house. And I tell her the story. And I say, you know, I sat there this morning thinking, what would Cokie do? And my sister Laura said to me, Stephen, you have this all wrong because Cokie would have been sleeping on Glenn's couch the night before. She was certainly correct about that. And later in the day, I'm telling my son this story. And I tell, her what Laura, I tell him what Laura said, and he looks at, says to me over the phone, Dad, you both have it wrong. Mom would have been there the last three nights sleeping on the couch. And that's true. That's true. And that, in the end, is the most important message of this book. And hopefully, if you listen to it, I've done the audio version myself. If you read it, you will learn something about being a good person. You will learn something about what would Cokie do. And I hope that that's what this book will accomplish. It's a very simple goal. It's a very simple message. Be more like Cokie. Thank you. Thank you for watching this presentation of the virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival. Please visit our official bookseller, Cavalier House Books, and receive 20% off all featured festival titles through the end of the year. 
A special thank you to our festival sponsors. The Louisiana Book Festival will return on October 29th, 2022.